Namzigonya. Hey, y'all, it's Carla Renata, a.k.a. the Curvy Film Critic, all things Lion King, right here, stay right there. <laughs> You're tuned into Black Hollywood Live, the world's first digital broadcast network devoted entirely to urban entertainment and pop culture. Tune in right now. Hey, hey, everybody, Hakuna Matata. Welcome back to episode 68 of The Curvy Critic with Carla Renata right here at Black Hollywood Live. If this is your first time joining us, please pop on over to YouTube. Give me those fabulous thumbs up if you like what you see, if you like what you hear on iTunes and Spotify. Give me some love and I will give it right back. Please join the chat room if you are able. If you're not able to join the chat room, please leave me some comments in the comment section and I will comment right back at you. So let me just start out by saying, I know I have been all over social media, totally geeking out over The Lion King, but it's because I was in The Lion King. I played Shinzi in the LA production for three years, but I'll get to that in a minute. Um, I want to talk about an, an interview that I did with a director named Yugu, and her documentary, A Woman's Work, The NFL Cheerleading Problem, debuted at the AFI Docs Film Festival, and because technology was betraying me, as it usually is <laughs> over here at Black Hollywood Live, I wasn't able to show this interview in real time, but I really want you to check it out this week because I think it's important, especially with the NFL season, slowly approaching us very soon. So check it out with Yugu. Yes? Yes, I did, yeah. Was there a huge cheerleading culture in Canada? There actually wasn't. And part of that is kind of why I was interested in this film, um, because I didn't grow up with that. In my high school, there was no cheerleading. It's a totally different kind of sports culture and sort of athlete culture in high school and college in Canada. Because, you know, here in high school, all the kids' parents come to watch their games. And it's such a big community kind of thing. Like, in, in Canada... I played basketball and other team sports, but none of our parents came to watch the games. And it's not because we're bad. Like, we won some provincial championship and stuff, but it's just not really, like, a community type of thing. You're just doing the sport, you're having fun, and you're going to play these games, but it's not, like, people coming out and, and people supporting you and cheering you on. Also in Canada, there is a football team where I'm from, Vancouver. There's BC Lions team. I don't know anyone that went to see their games. <laughs> So there was, so I did not know what football was. I just didn't. So when I came to the United States, I went to USC in LA for my grad degree. And that was when Pete Carroll was the coach. Uh huh. And it was, you know, before their whole scandal. <laughs> it was such a huge thing. And I tutored football players because I couldn't work outside the school. And I just got a taste of the ecosystem of this sport and how everybody is there to support this game, the players, the sport. And, you know, it wasn't necessarily about them going to college and getting an ed education. It was about them playing football. So that was really fascinating. And, you know, that's when I started watching movies about football or TV shows like Friday Night, Friday Night Lights, like any given Sunday. And it just drew me in as someone who is an outsider to this country to understand the forces of American culture. And so cheerleaders really played a huge role in that. Although I didn't grow up with cheerleading, per se, in my own personal experience, they're definitely outside of the U.S., like a, a symbol of, of American culture because it is so linked to football. You know, it's the female image, the female body and the look and that spirit that really it sort of represents a part of American culture, like the optimism, the energy, the enthusiasm, like the relentless pursuit of, I guess, happiness. <laughs> you know what I mean? That uh -huh. I feel like cheerleaders really represent. And so that's something that people outside of this, the U.S. definitely see. And when I found out they were not even getting paid in some cases or paid less than minimum wage, it was shocking. It was heartbreaking in many ways. And that made me want to explore that and, and look into it and find out more about these women. What was their childhood? What was their upbringing? And what made them really pursue this fight? And sort of how will they change as they go through this? Jane Seymour did a, a made-for-television movie mm -hmm. where she played a reporter that went undercover with the 
the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders to find out if there were any sexual allegations going on or any funny business going on. And she discovered that there wasn't. But this was a movie. And right. it was a movie specifically designed to bring even more attention to the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders than they were already getting. And what's interesting about it is that the title of your doc, A Woman's Work, the first thing I thought about in the first 15 minutes of the film, it basically is a play on words and it should be a woman's worth because women yes. are and were and have been devalued as human beings yes. no matter what lane we decide to choose. Yes. Yes. And now with the cheerleading culture, it's come down to whether you are a feminist or whether you are prevalent in this cheerleading culture, which a lot of them believe that cheerleading is not about you. It's about the team. Well, the team's yes. getting paid. Yes. The organization's exactly. getting paid. Yes. You should get paid too. When you broke down the numbers throughout the organization, who was getting paid what? Yeah. And I realized that the concession dudes, the concession and the mascot was getting yeah. paid more than the cheerleaders. Mm -hmm. The fact that they had that play on words about them being independent contractors. Yes, yes. Instead of employees. So that leads me to believe that these chicks were so excited mm -hmm. about being part of that culture that they didn't pay attention to their contract. No, not at all. It's extremely competitive to get on these teams where hundreds of women try out and they pick 40 women. That is even before you get the contract in front of you. And it's not like, oh, take it home, look at it, let us know if you have questions, you know, come back and sign it. It's like, oh my God, you made the team, this is amazing. And you're like already with women that you want to be teammates with, right? And then they give you this contract and you're like, oh, here's contract. Okay, sign it. Not only was I appalled by the contract situation, in Lacey's yeah. case, when Lacey discovered that she wasn't going to get paid to the end of the year yeah. and then when they got paid it was what twelve hundred and fifty dollars yes for a year yes. of traveling and spending money on nails and hair mm -hmm. and makeup mm -hmm. and working out at a gym like really yeah. though yes <laughs> really when i looked at her contract which was illegal aside from the pay asset of it the other clauses i wasn't sure about you know like oh you get paid at the end of the season i didn't know necessarily you had to be paid every two weeks i didn't know the arbitration clause you have this needs to be arbitrated in front of roger goodell oh that's illegal and it doesn't benefit me as a whole we lack the knowledge to know our rights especially when it comes to contract work and so that's why i think it's important with this film that we want to use it too to educate people and just really let people know like you, this is something that we all need to be aware of but on the other side it's also responsibility of the employers it shouldn't always be the responsibility of the people who are getting taken advantage of absolutely to, absolutely to do what's right it's actually you know they're the ones who are writing these illegal contracts and putting in front of these women over and over again and they did it because you know they could get away with it but that doesn't take away their legal responsibility in this case i think that's that's what a lot of people think about when they hear about this. You did sign the contract, you knew what you were getting into, but that's not the end of the conversation. Maybe that's the first part, but the rest of it, and the most important part, is what these teams are doing and what tactics they use to continue to take advantage of these people. You guys say in the film that women watching NFL games is at an all-time high. Mm -hmm. Do you think that if there were any women in a power position within the right. NFL, mm -hmm that this would even exist or if it would change? And do you also think that the rapid onset of the Me Too Time's Up movement yeah. mm -hmm. has really escalated this whole situation? So that's a really great question. It's very interesting. So in Buffalo, the owners, there, there are two owners, uh, and their husband and wife. They're called the Pagulas. The wife is now the president of the team. In that case, they're the ones that fired all of the cheerleaders after this lawsuit was brought on. And basically in the media, blame these women's lawsuits for shutting down the team when it had nothing to do, the women had no say in whether the team would continue. It was the actual ownership that decided to shut down the team, which is actually like a classic union busting tactic. Oh, you guys want rights? Okay, we'll just shut you down and not, and you can't have a job anymore. In that case, it still hasn't gotten better. And I think you can see too, this question of, is it just about placing women in places of power? Yes, I think in some cases that can really help. 
itself, but at the same time, if the values, if the core structure of the organization doesn't change, it's just going to be replacing one thing with another thing that fits into the same system of values. You know what I mean? It doesn't actually do. change the reality of that workplace. You know, there's a lot of ingrained misogyny within us. We all grew up in this society, this culture is very patriarchal. And so many subconscious ways or unconscious ways, we are a part of that too. And it just takes a lot of time and thought to deprogram ourselves and from that individual to scale up to an entire organization. And the NFL, I mean, yeah, it was from the ground up. It was about men. It was about white men, you know, and mm -hmm. you can see the optics of that with the players. It's Absolutely. Like black and brown bodies who are, you know, getting out there who have, there's an 100% injury rate for the players. The whole like the CTE concussions issue with player safety, like all of that. And now it's women. And so that's why I feel like there's such a microcosm of the problems America is facing right now in the rest of society, but in some ways it's in a very more extreme fashion. I'm glad um, you brought up the CTE situation because yeah. a couple of years ago when that movie Concussion came mm -hmm. out with Will Smith, I thought, mm -hmm. uh oh, the NFL is in trouble. They about to go yeah. down. It's going to be yeah. a wrap and nothing right. happened. No. <laughs> So you have these players who are being injured, some of them having CTE and doing crazy off the wall stuff in some instances resulting in a loss of life. And then you have the cheerleading culture where the women yes. are being treated like property Crap. as yeah, opposed exactly. to a flesh and blood human being that has right. value. It doesn't make it any better than the way women were valued in the 50s where mm -hmm. your sole job was to take care of human being, be it your child or or your husband and cook and clean and that's all you were it was almost like you were a workhorse as a human being being a yes. cheerleader isn't any better being a cheerleader in this particular instance means you're dressing up in some instances it almost feels like it's not any better and I hate to say this but it's not any better than being a prostitute because you're basically mm -hmm. dressing up to be pretty for men right mm -hmm. and for them to go oh you look really wonderful smile believe in yourself and everybody else will believe in you too Mm -hmm. What a privilege, what an honor this is. It's not a privilege to be treated like crap. No, and, and it's not. And it's really sad because, you know, when you hear like Lacey and Maria talk about why they want to do this and how they feel when they are, you see the possibility of this work environment, of this job, just being a, such a, a positive space. They say, okay, you betrayed the sisterhood by bringing upon this lawsuit. But what is true sisterhood? The truth of it is like, you know, you could have that, you know, you could have real support for each other but can also mean that you are fighting for yourself and your rights and you're not just silencing each other you know what I mean it didn't actually really help them to come together that much because there is still this culture of fear and silence like within that community and the fear of disrupting the status quo and the fear of confronting the abuse you know in a way these younger women came out and said okay wait this is wrong this is basically abuse but these other women who have done it for years and have been a part of the alumni associations for years it's also very difficult for them to confront the fact that maybe they were also abused yeah it's a very hard thing to to confront in yourself and admit because then you are weak you are vulnerable right and you know you feel like a, you probably feel like a piece of crap one other thing i want to add is you know you asked about the me too movement and how that's affecting things what some of the teams are now doing whether it's mba or nf or even NHL, they're actually trying to desexualize the cheer squads and the dance teams and sort of circumvent or preemptively circumvent or stop any allegations of sexual harassment or change the optics that, oh, this is, you know, a, a team of women and your team is run by all men by really changing these teams and adding men into the teams and then also making the outfits covering more skin. And while in some ways, you know, that is great, obviously. I mean, we don't want these women to be hypersexualized if they if they don't want to be hypersexualized. But the way the teams are going about it is basically firing a lot of these women that have been with the organization and undervalued, underpaid for so long and telling them to go away and then we're going to replace you with this whole other team. And this just speaks to the fact that these women do not have agency in this work, in this job at all, because they don't have that collective unity between them 
and they don't have a union, you know, they never they never had a union that was successful, that they didn't have any say in the future of this job that they all love. Now it's just up to the teams that are dictating the changes without consulting these women, um, without having them at the table. And that's just really sad, to be honest. And the reason they're doing it is, again, because they want to, instead of just making things right, instead of just paying these women better, treating them fairly, having a culture that is more, giving them more agency, they're just doing it in a way that's sweeping this under the rug and sidestepping some of these core issues and sidestepping the Me Too movement by saying, oh, look, it's men who are on this team too. It's not just women. And oh, they're even not that sexy. And it's, it's almost like blaming the victim. Like, oh, you were sexually harassed. Why are you wearing such a short skirt? Like, make your skirt longer. It's a very arcane type of approach. I hope in the future that it is able to change lives or at least change people's opinions about what is going on and maybe someone will see it who actually has some type of power to make a mm. difference in this culture. Yes, that would be amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Yugu. I appreciate you. Talk to you soon. Okay, bye. Bye. So Yugu was great to talk to because she actually really broke down what the NFL cheerleader problem is. And I kept saying cheerleading problem, but it's cheerleader problem. And basically what the problem is, is that a lot of these NFL teams are paying the mascots. They're, the concession dudes are getting more money than these girls that are the cheerleaders. And that's just not acceptable. It really is not acceptable. And so I'm glad that she shed a light on it. The documentary will be available nationwide as soon as the football season starts. I believe it's been picked up by an entity. I'm not, I don't remember what entity or what outlet she said it has picked it up, but I do know that it has been picked up out of the AFI Docs Film Festival and will be distributed across the country for people to see. And I hope that it gets a little bit more light and love than the film Concussion did, as you heard me mention in my interview with Yugu, because I remember when Concussion came out with Will Smith, I thought, like I said, I thought the NFL was going to be in trouble. I thought, uh-oh, here we go, because there were all these football players that it had been linked back to them getting hit in the head and getting concussions, the fact that they were killing themselves, that they were like losing their minds a little bit, and it was linked back to them getting these concussions while playing football. But when you look at the, the game of football in the United States, you look at how much money they make, when it comes down to all those people losing all that money, then they're a little slow on the uptake to do anything about it because, you know, they're really not trying to empty out their pockets. They don't really care that these people's health are being, these people's health issues are being challenged, that their families are being challenged by the health issues. They don't care how much money that these families have to go through in order to deal with these health issues for these men. Because a lot of them, they do have their NFL retirement and a lot of other things that, that come into play in terms of paying for their health expenses. But when it comes to that kind of injury, it's a lot of money involved. So when you guys see this, it's called, again, A Woman's Work, The NFL Cheerleader Problem. It is directed by Yugu. When you see it, please, please, please take time out of your day, stop what you're doing, and check it out and spread the word because I think it is a message that is important about the hypersexualization of women in this country on the field. Now, having said that, a lot of these girls audition and they want to be in that position, but they do that not knowing that they're not going to get paid until once a year. You heard me say that one of those girls um, didn't get paid until the end of the year and she got $1,250 for a whole year. Can you imagine? I can't. So I'm going to get off my soapbox about that, but I really just wanted to make you guys aware of that issue, bring it to light, give it some love, give you goose some love. As I've said here many times, on The Curvy Critic with Carla Renata. I am about empowering women filmmakers, anybody that is in front of or behind the camera that is a female making a difference. I'm all about giving them some light and love right here at Black Hollywood Live. Okay, now having said that, let me get to my next interview. So before I talk about Miss Florence Kazumba, a lot of you guys may know her from being Io in the Black Panther in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. A lot of you may know her simply from being the voice of Shinzi in this new live action version of The Lion King. She also did the role of Shinzi 
in the German production of The Lion King in Hamburg, and I was Shinzi in the Los Angeles production of The Lion King right here in LA at the Pantages Theater. I did it from the day it opened until the day it closed. It was the most wonderful time of my life. I had the best time ever in The Lion King, and I was directed by Julie Taymor, and I had the original scar from Broadway, John Vickery, as my scar. Jeffrey Polk and Price Waldman were my hyenas, um, playing Banzai and Ed, respectively. We had such a great time, and The Lion King holds very, very dear memories for me. I will give my review of The Lion King, this new 2019 live-action version, as well as some tidbits of trivia that I have discovered along the way and share those with you right after we air this interview with my girl Florence Kazumba. The stage production. Yeah. Doing Shinzi in that puppet for somebody that's shorter, it's easier because you're yeah. lower to the ground that's and you're true. really tall. How tall are you? Five ten? Uh, I don't even know. I'm, I'm one seventy three. <laughs> I don't know. That thing. No, I don't. You don't even I'm know what that side. I think you're um, about five ten. You close. You you're kind of tall. I think I'm smaller. Really? Yeah. But the thing is, don't forget. Um, well, maybe everybody looks taller than me because I'm short. Before I did the musical, I did Cats, so I was already on four. Oh. You know, I was already. I was gonna say you must this. be a dancer because your posture yeah. is like. But it wasn't hard for you to navigate because you were a dancer. Exactly. So you know how to pull that posture up. The thing is, when I went into the musical, they told me, you need to work on your back. Not because I had a problem, but they said, you need to keep your back and your front really, really strong. And that really, really helped. And I remember when I started working on this one, in Germany, when I did the German synchronization, but also there, I immediately went into this position just because I knew, you know, like when you do the role for a year every day, you just know what Shenzi means. Right. I did it for three years. Yeah. Three years I was in that position. I understand. I do. Exactly. I do. And being able, like how we worked in the black box, being able to move around your colleagues, because you know how it is on stage. We were allowed to do that here too, and it was just amazing. That was great. I, I remember you saying that before, and I thought that that was really great that they gave you all that flexibility yeah. to move around. How much of a change was it? Because when you're doing the stage version, being very physical mm -hmm. like that, and relying on the audience for the reaction to navigate how the lines are going to go, because like you were saying earlier, the hyenas were much more humorous in the stage yeah. production. They, were, they weren't as menacing as they are in this production and so voice wise how were you able to manipulate that with just your voice they recorded me walking around my colleagues so I could bring the physicality into it anyway and because I so have it in me I can just it just comes out it doesn't matter how I feel mm -hmm. but the advantage with this one is you know my buddies they are really strong people and very confident so when you have people that just give you a lot of energy you act and you react and that's also what I had on stage you know there was no like what does the audience think because in that moment I don't think what anybody else thinks but when the hyenas get together it can be funny in this one it's not funny at all no it was very girl I jumped a couple of times I was like well okay I, I'm a little scared yeah you have uh, to take them more serious huh? you have to take them more serious yeah but I like that and I, I like that because there's nothing funny about them and there's also nothing funny about Sky and these two together or Sky and the hyenas that's just dangerous it really is I wanted to see more with you and Scar though. I really <laughs> wanted to hear more with you and Scar because the two of y'all together, ooh, I was I kept I was sitting on the edge of the seat going, ooh, are Shinzi and Scar gonna have a moment? And y'all didn't. I was so sad. You have become the undeemed queen of the Marvel Universe a little bit <laughs> with Captain America and Black Panther. And how is that how how do you feel going from that world to the Pride Lands? Oh, you know what? I always say I just take baby steps. I love fantasy. Mm. I'm the most comfortable in it because in fantasy I can be anything. Being in an animal world is something that is familiar because I've been I've been animals on stage. So cats and lion yeah, king, yeah. Um, I, I, I you're I, in the cat family. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, I wouldn't compare any of these jobs. Mm. Uh, I enjoy mm. whatever comes. I'm not planning anything because had you told me years ago that I would be in this movie, I would have never believed it. Absolutely. But it also taught me that who am I to tell me you're not able to do something, you know? Sometimes you need other people who, I mean, do, you need to do your work. 
in yes. order to work on a, a certain level but you also need people that trust in you or people that give you the chance and trust me you know from the stage version in my year we were four shenzies so you're not special when you're playing any of the characters because you know that when you drop off the stage there's somebody, somebody else to take, take your take place show. and that's what i think with this one too there are a few of us that were chosen to be in this movie a lot of people could have done it so i really am very grateful that i had the opportunity to give my view or my taste into Shenzi. You were the right person and this was the right time for you to do it. Absolutely. I mean, no, I wouldn't say I'm the right person for it, but I was ready for it. I would say you were the right person for it. <laughs> I would say that unequivocally. What is your favorite part of The Lion King? The one, the, the one moment in the show that whenever you hear it or whenever you think about it, it just warms your heart. I don't have a favorite part, but there are a lot of sentences that Mufasa says. I like the idea of true king searches for what he can give. The reason why I like it is, look, we have different animals, and some are male, some are female. A lot of the things that Mufasa tells Simba or us are things that work for all of us. Imagine going through life protecting everything that the light touches, which would be protecting everything, mm -hmm. you know? There are all these things that work for us now, and if I think about the fact that in 94, the movie came out, I don't really think we are very much smarter now, 25 years later. I would agree with that. Or oh. the idea how they raised their son. They're very honest with him. It doesn't happen a lot in a movie that maybe a young character asks. We're going to be together forever, and somebody else, a father, is honest saying, no, we're not. You know, there will be the time when I go, but my spirit will still be there. And it's very honest. It's a great life lesson. Yeah. It's a great life lesson in when someone's time on this earth comes to an end in the physical realm, they still live on. They live on in you. They live on this person. They live, they live on through whoever is left to carry on the lineage, right? Yes. So that's the big story of the film. I'm going to cut my time short with you because I want to take a picture with my other shinzi. Can you do that? <laughs> yeah, okay, absolutely. Great. I love the fact that I cut myself off so that I could take a picture with Florence because I'm like, you know, we had to have a little Shenzi showdown where we talked about Shenzi and what that was like for each one of us in that in that respect. And, you know, I had to just document the situation. So thank you, Miss Florence Kazumba, for taking the time out of your busy schedule and promoting The Lion King, the live action version, to talk with the curvy critic over here. And I understand that you guys had a fantastic fabulous premiere just last night in London where Mr. Um, Elton John showed up and Prince Harry and the Duchess of Sussex, Miss Meghan Markle showed up. So I'll have all those pictures up online in a minute when I get to them. But I went to the world premiere here in Los Angeles and I had the best time ever. It was very nostalgic for me, as I said, but before I um, get into my review of The Lion King, I just want to talk about a few things. So for you watching YouTube right now, you see this picture of me on a red carpet situation at The Lion King world premiere. But when I did The Lion King here in Los Angeles, um, I worked with Lebo M. And Lebo M has done the music for every incarnation of The Lion King ever, ever. And that's a picture of me and Julie Taymor, the director of the stage version of The Lion King, for which she won a Tony Award um, at the opening night. And then 20 years later, there's me and Lebo at the world premiere. It was so awesome to see him after 20 years and to see that I kind of aged, but he didn't. <laughs> I did my Zulu makeup. I did a little bit of Zulu lip. I didn't want to freak people out here at Black Hollywood Live with full-on Zulu makeup. But I wore Zulu makeup to the world premiere of The Lion King because I was the only person there from the Los Angeles company I had to represent. And, of course, you know, I had to show some pictures here at Black Hollywood Live of my time as Shinzi in The Lion King with my puppet and my makeup on. And Lord knows I couldn't go to the world premiere of my Shinzi makeup. I would have looked like a straight-up... Zulu character and folk would have been scared because my makeup in the the version on stage was all white makeup with circles around my eyes and then I really want to share you share with you guys this poster um it's not a poster it's really a costume rendering of the Shinzi costume which not only did Julie Taymor direct the Lion King but she designed the costumes for the stage version of the Lion King and for my opening night gift she gave me this costume rendering of my character Shinzi and she signed it for me it says to Carla 
bravo, Julie Tamor. So I wanted to share that with you guys because I, I cannot tell you, I just can't talk about it enough. It was a very, very special time for me working on The Lion King. But I did want to share some facts with you about the show before I go on with my review of it. So in terms of the musical and particularly the Los Angeles production, I wasn't the first choice for Shinzi. A young lady named Fuchsia Walker was the first choice for Shinzi. And because um, Julie had a hard time finding someone that she really connected with and wanted to play the role of Rafiki, it was suggested to her that she see Fuchsia for Rafiki. She loves Fuchsia. They had worked together on another production at Lincoln Center in New York called The Green Bird. So Fuchsia was bumped up into Rafiki, and I was the last man standing, so they bumped me up into Shinzi. And both myself, Fuchsia, and Mo Daniels, who played Nala, all three of us were nominated for an NAACP Theater Award. <laughs> None of us won. <laughs> We all lost to Charlene Woodard, who had another one of her one-woman shows up in Los Angeles at the time. I think she had performed it at the Geffen Playhouse, but she won. But we, child, we was just excited to be nominated and dress up and be honored by the NAACP, so there was that. Um, the opening night party for The Lion King at the Pantages Theater was literally across the street at the Pantages Theater. So if you've ever been in Los Angeles right now, right now, that Sunshine parking lot is now an apartment building, but back in the day, in the year 2000, which was almost 20 years ago, it was a parking lot. And Disney literally turned that parking lot into Africa. It was the most amazing thing I'd ever seen in my entire life. It was gorgeous. And I thought, oh, I'm in Hollywood. They can make magic out of anything. It was really great wanted to share with you that in all of the stage productions of The Lion King, there are only five characters in that show that are white people. Those characters would be Scar, Zazu, Ed, Pumbaa, and Timon. Those are the only characters in any stage version of The Lion King that are not African American, making that show 97% African American, which is why it's so popular in addition to a whole bunch of other things. Um, I said earlier that I worked with the original Scar from Broadway, John Vickery, and right now there's a young brother that I know from back in the day named Alton White. Alton White has the distinction of being the longest running longest running actor to play the role of Mufasa on Broadway. I think he's played over 750 performances. And if I have that number incorrect, Alton, please correct us, sister, because I know you will. But he's been on Broadway doing it for a really long time. In terms of Shinzi, I actually held the record for Shinzi up until Benita Hamilton came in and she broke my record. She is the current Shinzi on Broadway right now, and she has been there for over 10 years years. I know, mind-boggling, right? So let me give you a couple of facts about this 2019 live action version. John Favreau is the only director that Disney has had to do back-to-back -back live action versions of films. He's known for doing the Jungle Book live action and now he's doing The Lion King. He just can't stay out of the jungle, huh? <laughs> Unless he's in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, John Favreau is in The Lion King or in a jungle somewhere. Um, James Earl Jones, Hans Zimmer, Elton John and Tim Rice are the only people, in addition to Lebo M, who worked on the original animated film. I found out from a little friend of mine that Jeremy Irons, who was the original Scar in the animated feature, had actually expressed interest in reprising his role as Scar for this live action version. I also heard that Hugh Jackman was rumored to play the role and that Benedict Cumberbatch turned it down. But the role of Scar eventually was cast, as she would tell Ajoa for, and baby, I tell you, he is doing his thing. I'll talk about him in a minute. James Earl Jones is the only actor to reprise his role from the 1994 animated version. He reprises his role as Mufasa, while Matthew Broderick was replaced by Donald Glover as Simba. Maura Kelly was replaced by Beyonce as Nala. Nathan Lane was replaced by Billy Eichner as Timon. Ernie Sabella was replaced by Seth Rogen as Pumbaa. Robert Guillaume, the late Robert Guillaume, was replaced uh, by John Connie as Rafiki. And let me just give you a side note about that. Robert Guillaume is from my hometown, St. Louis, Missouri. He was the first African American to play the title role in The Phantom of the Opera. And he also was the first um, 
not the first, but he had a, a TV series in the 70s called Benson, for which he won multiple Emmys for. So I just wanted to give my St. Louis homie some love in that respect. John Oliver as Zazu um, was replaced by the late Madge Sinclair. You may know Madge Sinclair from being in the original miniseries Roots. Alfre Woodard, um, I'm sorry, the late Madge Sinclair was replaced by Alfre Woodard, I'm sorry, as Sarabi. Jeremy Irons, we talked about being replaced as Shuatel Ejo for Whoopi Goldberg was the original Shenzi in the animated feature. Florence has replaced Florence Kazumba, as I said, replaced her in this one. Cheech Marin was replaced by Keegan Michael Key as Banzai. And Jim Cummings was replaced with Eric Andre as Ed Azizi the Hyena. Um, side note Scar's villainous song Be Prepared was originally left out of the film due to the Nazi zine, Nazi zine, Nazi themes, excuse me, Nazi themes, which Disney executives were afraid to tackle, also because Chiwetel Ejiofor's voice was not fit for the singing. I disagree with that. He did a fantabulous job, because literally, I mean, John Vickery wasn't a great vocalist either, but he made it work, so I don't know why they even said that online. Um, what else did I want to tell you guys about this show? Oh, I'll talk about that later. I, I see my notes, and I'll just talk about that later. I also wanted to share with you some things that you may not know about The Lion King that I got from Oh My Disney. So, The Lion King's original title was supposed to be King of the Jungle. Can you imagine? Talking about King of the Jungle, that's so tired. I'm glad they went with The Lion King. It doesn't really have that same like ring to no. it like Lion King does. I know, it's tired, right? I was like, mm, I don't know how I feel about that. Yeah, I wouldn't watch <laughs> King of the Jungle. I personally watched Lion King. Yeah, I don't think, I don't <laughs> think I'd be checking for King of the Jungle. <laughs> um... Jeremy Irons didn't originally want to do Scar. He was reluctant to do it, but then when it came out, he was all about it. And then, as I told you earlier, he wanted to redo it, but they were like, no, nah, we good. We're going to get you a show for. <laughs> the Wildebeest Stampede in the animated version, it took three years to create that because the CG department created an entirely new program in to, to make sure that the Wildebeest didn't pass each other so that you never saw them pass each other. And I'm going to talk about the CGI in this new version in a second. Simba and Scar were animated on separate coast in the U.S. That's some news. I didn't know that. Nathan Lane and Ernie Sabella, who played Timon and Pumbaa respectively, actually auditioned to be the hyenas. Can you imagine Nathan Lane as a hyena? I can't even. Um, Simba, Sarabi, Rafiki, and Pumbaa are actually Swahili words that mean respectively lion, mirage, friend, and foolish. So I just wanted to share that information with you all because after all, I am the Lion Queen and I have all information about the Lion King because like I said, I did it for three years. There's nothing about that show that I don't know. And if I don't know it, then somebody enlighten me, but I'm pretty sure there's a whole bunch of stuff that, that, that I mean, there's, I just, I know everything about the Lion King. I'm just gonna say that. <laughs> So let me get on with my review of The Lion King. So The Lion King was will be released on June 19th through Disney. This is a live action version. So it is not like the animated version, which was released in the early 90s. It is not like the musical version, which was released in the late 90s. This is a live action version. And 99% of it was computer generated. There's only one scene in this version of The Lion King that is not computer generated. I'll leave it up to you to guess which one it is. This is what I have to say about The Lion King. I loved it. And I think I have no ability to be par impartial about it because <laughs> I was in it. So I feel some kind of way. But this is what I, what I really enjoyed. I enjoyed the little Nala and the, the little Simba who were J.D. McCrary and Shahidi Wright Joseph. They were fan tabulous they brought that energy and that exuberance that nala and simba have to have as young cubs they did it 100 percent on the money she would tell us for as i said was a fantabulous scar he was everything but the ones who stole that movie were billy eichner as timon <laughs> and Seth Rogen as Pumbaa. They steal the movie, as do Nathan Lane and uh, Ernie Sabella when they did the animated version, and so did Max Casella, and um, I can't remember the, the young man's man, uh, name who played it on Broadway, but 
Timon and Pumbaa always knock it out of the park. They are hilarious, and it's just really, really funny. The hyenas is a different kind of hyena action, and like I said, when I was talking about being interviewed, I mean, when I was interviewing Florence, I was a little scared. A sister was jumping in her seat. The high, this is, and what I will say about this version of the Lion King, this version of the Lion King is not suitable, I don't think, for any child that's under the age of five, because the hyenas are a little menacing, and they are a little scary, and they may scare children, but I will say that I thoroughly enjoyed this version of The Lion King. It focused more on the actual story of birth, death, loyalty, and living on through through different people in your family or different animals in, in your lane. It's more about the story of The Lion King. He lives in you, living on, living through the light, everything that the light touches. It's more about that than it is the music. There's no comparisons to the animated version. There's no comparisons to the musical version. So if you're going expecting to see that, you need to put that in a trash can somewhere because that's not going to happen. This is a completely different version. It's reimagined for a completely different new generation. This generation now is very digital. They're very visual. And this generation will love it the same way my generation and the generations after me love the musical. So that's what I have to say about The Lion King. It will be released on June, June, July 19th, which is later on in this week. And I just want to, you know, give y'all a little, you know, give you a little history with The Lion King while I'm telling you my reviews and whatnot, because that's how I roll. I also want to tell you that Glory is celebrating its 30th anniversary with an event in tandem with Fathom Events and TCM. It will be in theaters. You can get your tickets, I believe, July 21st and July 24th. This is the film where Denzel Washington won his first Oscar. It is centered around the Civil War and the black community's involvement in that as soldiers. It was a groundbreaking film at the time. Matthew Broderick was in it. And side note about Matthew Broderick, I was on Broadway with Matthew Broderick right after he did The Lion King. And Ernie Sabella was in, Matthew Broderick, myself, and Ernie Sabella were all in a show on Broadway together right about the time they did The Lion King, and we all went and watched it together. So that was just a side note. But um, he was also in Glory. It's celebrating its 30th anniversary. Um, Morgan Freeman is also in that film, and it's dealing with the spirit of the 54th Regiment in Massachusetts that was African-American. I also wanted to let you know that Aquafina. there's been a lot of talk about the Little Mermaid recently. And last week I talked about Halle Bailey um, being named as Ariel and how much drama that was. And I actually saw Halle Bailey at the opening night world premiere of The Lion King here in Los Angeles. And I went up to her and I told her, hold your head up high. Don't let those haters bring you down, sister. We are there for you and we got you. Mermaids are not real. They are mythical creatures. Leave that child alone. I'm going to leave that alone. But Aquafina, <laughs> Aquafina is joining the cast as um, Melissa McCarthy is also joining as Ursula. It's being directed by Rob Marshall and incorporating some songs from the 1989 animated film. Um, and some of those songs are being written by Lin-Manuel Miranda from Hamilton. So there's that. Um, Emmy winner Niecy Nash is going to star in Kidnap, the Kamaya... Yeah, the Kamaya Mobley story on Lifetime, which is being produced by Robin Roberts production company, Rockin' Robin. Um, it's also starring Raven Simone, who was in The Hate You Give. Raven Simone Farrell, excuse me, who was in The Hate You Give. And Taronda Jones, who was guest starring for a minute on Empire and was recurring until it was canceled. Um, this is a true story of a young woman who discovers at age 18 that she was abducted abducted as a baby and the family she knew to be hers wasn't hers at all so look out for that from rock and robin productions starring um emmy winner my girl niecy nash d Rees, i love me some d Rees. d Rees was the director of a film called pariah she got an oscar nomination for mudbound in 2017 and she got some emmy nods for a HBO biopic that she did around Bessie Smith, which starred Queen Latifah. She is writing and directing a musical fantasy based on 
The Kid's Exquisite Follies, and it's based on her own original script. The film is described as swirling futuristic roller coaster journey of a young musician who catapults herself from anonymity of her hometown, same old, same old, to the bright lights and plastic sights of the fabled It City in search of stardom. It sounds like a fantastical version of The Wizard of Oz. I'm down for all of that. Um, I also wanted to share with you a film called Sea of Shadows, which is um, produced by Leonardo DiCaprio. It's facing a total collapse of a war at sea that um, where the Mexican cartels have tried to kind of capitalize on a valuable fish called the Totoba. You really want to check that out. It's in theaters right now. And David Crosby, Doc, remember my name is in theaters right now. David Crosby was one of a quarter, uh, well, a third of Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Stuber is in theaters with Kumal Nanjani. It's produced by 20th Century Fox and starring, also starring Mira Sorvino. So I think that is my time, y'all. I'm sorry I didn't, after I started talking about The Lion King, I didn't get to you much in the chat room. But you can find me over at After Buzz TV in just a few minutes talking about everything General Hospital. You can find me a couple hours after that and after buzz tv talking about american princess where we have rory o'malley in studio who plays brian the queen elizabeth's right hand man over at after buzz tv and of course you can find me here at black hollywood live the curvy critic every sunday at five o'clock give me some love give me them thumbs up on youtube go to spotify itunes iHeartRadio, and let your girl know that you love her thank you marlon wallace and um, Michael B for joining me in the chat room and anybody else who might be up in there at this point. I love you. I appreciate you. And I will see you the next time. Love, peace, and hair grease. Bye-bye. On behalf of our BHL staff, we would like to thank you for tuning in to Black Hollywood Live, the world's first digital broadcast network devoted entirely to urban entertainment and pop culture. Check out our Black Hollywood Live YouTube page for even more great programming and amazing content. And be sure to subscribe and like our channel when you do. I'm your BHL host, Nakia Monet, and you can find me on all social media at Kiki Boom Boom or at Black Hollywood Live. Black Hollywood Live. Hollywood redefined.